conversation because we have two atheists that, and they disagree on materialism slash physicalism. Um, there's obviously a distinction, but we're going to talk about whether or not materialism is true. Um, T. Jump is going to be taking the position that materialism is true, and Danny is going to be taking the position that it is not the case or it's false. So I guess with that, um, T. Jump, do you want to just start by giving like a basic opening statement, and then we'll um, mm, go from there? Nope. I'd like to hear his position first because I okay. don't know anything about what his position is going sure. to be, so I have no idea what direction I'm going to take. Okay. Go ahead, Danny. Right. So I'm a non-naturalist. I reject naturalism, although... Um, naturalism is not very well defined. People have different conceptions of the natural. And I think that might, you know, hint at a problem in itself, but um, I think it could be, that could be overcome. But the idea is that um, there are basically three, um, three concerns that I have. And uh, I think we've decided to focus on dualism. Uh, but the first concern that I have um, is that if we want to say that everything is natural, I, I, I'm afraid that it renders the term vacuous because um, when you predicate an object as natural, it just it's, you're just saying it's basically indicating that it's that it's an object. And I know I need to flesh that out more. But um, the second concern has to do with um, you know Platonism, abstract objects. I don't think those are natural things if they do exist. And um, then the third and final concern that I think we might be focusing on is um, I, I'm a dualist, right? I, I think that there is a distinction between mind and body. So I don't think that our minds are identical to our brains. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that that's what the kind of the meat of the discussion is, whether that's um, a plausible account of how things are. So All right, do you jump? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, his first concern is completely reasonable. Natural isn't well defined, but I define natural as no non-physical mind. So I don't think there is a non-physical mind anywhere in the universe doing anything or guiding the universe. I think the universe is ultimately just unguided physical forces like quantum fields or whatever, but no mind or intentionality doing the work. Um, his second objection, yeah, I think abstract objects don't exist at all. Abstract objects are made up labels that we use to apply to things based on generalities that we imagine. They're, they don't actually exist anywhere. There's no platonic objects. Um, his third one about the mind, yeah, the mind is purely just a part of the brain, and there's no reason to think there is this additional substance of consciousness, and it's not just an emergent property of more fundamental forces that are completely natural or physical in some sense. Um, it's definitely possible, or definitely for sure the case that we haven't discovered everything about the physical natural world. And so whatever consciousness is, because we haven't solved the problem of what consciousness is, is probably just going to be a combination of what that undiscovered stuff is. And there's positing a new entire entity or ontology of stuff that we have no reason to believe other than it just answers this question has no real basis any more than like positing a god so it's better just to say that whatever the cause of consciousness is or whatever consciousness is going to be discovered to be ultimately it's just going to be more of the physical stuff we've already discovered rather than positing an entirely new ontology for no reason and that's my position on the three things he mentioned all right danny is that enough to kind of get yeah, the conversation I started work off that right now i in my opening i just simply made claims i didn't give any arguments so um, but we can start with um, dualism, right? I think that's that's what we want to focus on. I'm a dualist because I take um, Hume's distinction between is and not very seriously, right? Um, I think that a state of um, of that expresses ought and a state that expresses is can't be identified with one another. So my job here is to show why various mental states, more specifically intentional states. Are, sta are states that express ought, not states that express is. Natural states, just think in terms of science, right? Science is in the business of, of approaching natural things, right? Maybe understanding the regularities and the behaviors of natural things, right? So it's in the business of what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen, right? But if it's the if you think about oughts, and I'm going to use when I say when I use the term normative or normativity, I'm I'm referring to oughts. Okay, so those are for our purposes synonymous, right? Just so there's no confusion about what I'm talking about. 
when we're talking about normative states, right, we're not expressing anymore what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen. We're talking about what should have happened. We're talking about what should be happening and what should happen in the future, right? So to me, I take those to be meaningfully distinct such that if you have a state that expresses what should happen, it can't be identified with a state that is happening. So case in point, a belief, right? I take beliefs, or maybe it might be easier to start with a desire, okay? I take, um, I'm, a, I'm a sort of subjectivist, a relativist, so I think that uh, I should do X if and only if I have a desire to do X, right? And that can only be true if there's a built-in ought um, in desire, right? Which means that desire has a concept of, of ought built into it, okay? Um, and that, that's to subvert Hume's guillotine, right? So I'm not deriving an ought from an is when I'm deriving an ought from a desire, right? So desires are themselves oughts, right? So if I desire water, okay, that can't be identified with the natural state because natural states, as I take it, are descriptive. They're not prescriptive, right? So the way my brain is, is, is a totally different state than what I desire to happen, right? What ought to happen, right? And that's the basis of my dualism. That's the argument. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying there are emotions that cause us to want stuff, and those emotions can't be caused by physicalism? Um, no, I'm not talking about causation, right? I'm not talking about explanation. I'm talking about identity, right? What are desires themselves identical to? Not what explains desires. It, I'm right with you in terms of it's perfectly plausible to think that a physical state interacts with a non-natural state like a desire, on my view at least, right? So alcohol, right, might cause all sorts of beliefs and desires, right? And there's an interaction between the physical and the mental, right? But I'm saying that those mental states can't be identified with any physical states, given my argument that I presented. Uh, so if we build an artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence has, we program it to like have some motivation, some program that we want it to fulfill. And it now has these emotions that are going to, cause it to try and fulfill those things. It's going to build a language to describe that. And that language would be a system of oughts because it has a compulsion to do something. And the ought language that we have is simply describing the compulsion to do something. And the compulsion is completely physical. So it just seems like you're making the classical idealistic argument that, well, we can't explain conscious experience. Therefore, it must be some completely new ontology rather than just an undiscovered part of physical ontology. Right. So I don't think I'm making that argument. I'm making the argument that given Hume's guillotine, given the fact that there's a distinction between is and ought, okay, that they can't be meaningfully derived from one another, given the fact desires, right, are, you can derive oughts from them, which means that they already have the built-in concept of ought, okay, they can't be identified with a natural state. Nowhere did I say, I don't know how consciousness works, I don't know um you know what's going on here so, Therefore, so I'm, not, I'm not quite following your argument here so we make up words that describe things that have nothing to do with reality like okay that doesn't mean that therefore there is this like new what? ontology Sorry. so so like we make up words like oughts so, so one of the solutions to the is ought distinction is that there are no oughts oughts do not exist we have an idea a language to describe oughts but they aren't a thing in reality outside of our imagination so we can imagine things that don't exist all the time we can imagine unicorns we can imagine leprechauns we can imagine gods they don't exist so arguing that because we can imagine these things we must have some kind of new ontology because our imagination can envision things that have no basis in reality doesn't make any sense yeah so um to say that oughts are just linguistic term you know they're just terms that we make up right yeah. I think it's missing the point for me because, like, I'll just give a simple example, right? Take the word cat and the word gato, right? Those mean the same thing, although they're different terms, okay? Sure. In the same way, ought, I should do something, uh, debe que ser, right? That's how you express it in, in Spanish, right? Those are different terms, but they mean the same thing. So I don't want to get in a terminological dispute, right? The terms are certainly tools that we make up, but the concepts, right? The meanings right behind them are not made up, right? Wait, wait, all... wait, what do you mean? So, so the concepts are also made up. They're literally things we've made up in our heads to describe something. Like we have a feeling and we, we describe that feeling with a concept. So we have a desire to do X, which is completely material. And then we create a feeling or a, a language to describe that feeling, which is we ought to do X. The oughts don't exist there. It's just a feeling that 
I want something. And then I describe that want with an ought. Yeah. So do you, th so there's a couple things I'm confused about. Number one, I think I'm a cognitivist about the good, right? That it, it can be false that it's good to rape people. It can be false that you should rape people, right? And if you're using the word feeling to, to express a qualitative state, right? Qualitative states, like the way things are like, you know, in your own subjective world, right? They're not true or false. So I'm not, a, I, I don't know if anything turns on that, but I don't take ots to be just feelings. I take, I'm a cognitivist. Uh, okay, so that doesn't answer what I said or at all. Well, so so, so I'm, I'm, I'm an objective, I believe in, I'm a moral realist, so I believe in objective morality, but you don't need aughts for objective morality at all. Uh, but if you have aughts in your objective morality, like they actually exist as a real thing, independent of just a language thing that we put on it, then yeah, you, you would want to say that aughts exist in some sense. I think that's false. Yeah. I, I don't think oughts exist at all. Oughts are just something we apply to moral statements. So if we know uh, some criteria of what morality is, we can establish what moral things are, then we can say we ought to do it once we know what morality is, but it's not the oughts that make it moral. So you can just apply the Euthyphro dilemma. Is something moral because we ought to do it, or ought we do it because it's moral based off of some objective standard? And I'd say that something is moral based off of some objective standard and then we just apply language that we ought to do it. The oughts aren't in any way entailed in morality. So if is, I think that's like, you're saying that because we have, there, uh, morality is real. And if morality is real, it requires oughts. Therefore, oughts are real. I, mean, yeah, I, I don't just... want to, I don't want to talk past you, right? If you, if you're, looks like you're using the terms differently, but I'm just going to tell you how I use the terms. I believe that if X is good, you should do X. Now, it seems like you don't believe that. No, that's perfectly fine. I can agree with that. So just, again, okay. apply, the, apply, apply, apply the Euthyphro dilemma here. Is something good because you ought to do it? Or ought you do it because it's good based off of some independent standard? Well, I think, an, I think it's analytically entails. Uh, like, if, I think they're analytics by meaning, right? The Euthyphro dilemma poses an issue with God um, being equated to good. And it's only an issue because God's commands or God's nature is, an, is a descriptive thing, whereas you're equating it with a prescriptive thing like goodness, and that's why it's a problem. The reason why it's not a problem to say X is good, therefore, meaningfully, we can get you should do X, is because they're analytically equivalent. They're not, you're not equating a descriptive thing like God's commands to a prescriptive thing like goodness. Well, I think that's exactly what you're doing. So try to answer the dilemma as best you can. It seems like you're saying something is moral because you ought to do it. Like those are synonymous terms. They, they, it is the oughtness that makes it moral. And it is, what is moral is that which you ought to do. It is the oughtness that is what makes something moral. I'm saying, no, that's just silly. The oughtness is a descriptive thing that we apply to it. We say, or it's, it happens to be a descriptive thing because we apply it to it. So we, we discover what objective morality is. We discover some set of criteria. It meets these criteria. We know it's moral. And then we say, okay, now that we know it's moral, we're going to say we ought to do it. But the oughts are nowhere entailed in that criteria. You don't need that. So I'm saying it's not analytically the same. The definition of ought is completely irrelevant. It's just a description we apply once we know what the set of moral criteria are. Okay. I sort of lost sight of the disagreement. So um, are, are you, are you saying that, are these identical propositions on your view, X is good and you ought to do X? Are those identical propositions? Yes or no? Uh, in a language sense, yes. But I'd say that well, there's an independent set of criteria that makes something moral and you can just not use the word ought just fine to describe that. You don't, the oughts don't make any difference to the morality. Right. I'm, well, the point is, is that if I say, if I'm expressing that something is good, Right, I can express that in the exact just using a different term like uh, or tool like ought. Right now, it seems like we're getting bogged down with the term ought, and I can just admit that. Right from my argument, uh, from the way I'm characterizing my argument, I can still make my argument. I can just use the term good. Okay. Okay. The idea is that if I desire X, X is good. I don't know what it would mean to say um, I desire X, but I think X is not good. All things being equal. Right, which is to say that we can derive goodness from desire, because that's what relative a moral relativism or moral subjectivism, right? That's the framework that it's operating on. That the sufficient conditions for X being good is that you desire X in some way. Okay, so 
So that's just to say, that's to establish that desires are normative, right? Because good is normative, right? So if you accept that I desire X is equivalent to X is good, if you accept that, then you also accept desires are normative things. Well, if you're using normative and ought synonymously, then no, I would disagree with that. I can, we can get rid of so, the term. Yeah, yeah. We, so, can, we just use the term good, okay? That's, that's so fine. I, take so, so I, I believe in moral realism. There are no oughts in my model whatsoever. It's all descriptive, I, and that's perfectly I can fine. Take that out of my, I can take that term out of my argument to simplify my argument, right? Okay, so, okay, I so, take, so I'm not following at all what you're arguing here. So how do you get to dualism? So I, I'm a purely materialist. I think I believe in objective morality, too. There are no oughts in mine, but... So, so I, I get all of that stuff too in just physicalism. So how are you saying that you need dualism to explain this this moral normativity? Yeah, I just distinguish with like, you know, I'm, you know Hume used the term ought. I'm going to replace ought with good. I think there's a, dis a distinction between good things and things that are not defined as good. Oh, okay, you already <laughs> said that. But So I, I also believe in morality. I believe in objective morality. I understand Hume's dilemma. I don't have any oughts. All I have is is's. And I still solve that problem. So obviously you I don't, don't know what you mean by ought. That's, that's fine. I don't care. So I also well, I believe in wait, wait, so I believe in moral realism with physicalism. So where where do you think the distinction here is? Like why do you need to say that there's dualism to have objective morality? Because I'm not saying well, okay. this. Okay. So the idea is that I distinguish between goodness, things that are good and things that are not good. That's to say between so do I. descriptive and prescriptive things. I think that desires are prescriptive. I think natural states are descriptive. Okay. That's so that if there's a distinction there, there's a distinction between the natural world and my desires. If objective morality exists and objective morality is inherently prescriptive and nothing in nature is prescriptive, yes, I just you just don't need that for morality. So I don't understand. Like, so, so you think that prescriptions must exist in morality. And well, I think they're synonymous. If it's moral, it's prescriptive. That's the same thing. So you think prescriptions must exist in morality. It's totally false, but you can think that. And therefore, because morality exists, prescriptions exist. And because prescriptions don't exist in nature, therefore, there must be some other kind of thing. That's That seems to be like your argument. I think that I think you've gotten it, yeah. Okay, so I can just reject premise two. You don't need prescriptions to have morality. You don't think anything, like, you don't think you have any prescriptions? Unto yourself? No, I think prescriptions are something we add to something. Like I have a feeling and I describe that feeling with a prescription, but the prescription doesn't exist in reality independent of my language. Wait, I just maybe. don't take feelings to be truth at. <laughs> so I don't, I don't understand that move. What? So I'm agreeing with you there. I'm saying the prescription doesn't describe reality. So there's no correspondence between the prescriptive language and reality. It's something I've made up like unicorn, a language. On a subjectivist view, that's false, right? Because a subjectivist is going to say, I, I have a prescription if and only if I have a desire. I'm not a subjectivist. I don't care. I don't care what their perception Well, I'm is. a subjectivist. So are you disputing dis subjectivism? I didn't bring up subjectivism. I said you did. So you have to present your right. argument I'm as to why you I'm giving you my argument. This. Right. What's the, the argument? Point, well, and even if you reject subjectivism, right? There's still an, uh, there's still some sort of agreement that there is a kind of prescription, although not an objective one, as you would take it. Yeah, it's just a language like to unicorn, something, so we make it it's up. It's good, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a language feature that we make up, like unicorns. There's nothing magical about that. You don't need some kind of new thing to think that we make up languages that don't describe reality. I don't take our dispute to be terminological. Okay, that right? doesn't it's help not a, at all. It's not like it's not like what what are we? I want to establish the same terms, and I try to do that by omitting the word "ought" because that seemed problematic for some reason. So, uh, what words? If you think it's just a language game that we're playing here, what terms are we are we disagreeing in terms of their meaning? It seems like we agree on the terms. No, I'm not saying we have at any point. I'm saying you need to present an argument that says we need this entirely new ontology. So everything you've described can be done with just a materialist ideology in the way I said. So prescriptions don't exist independent of language words we've made up. There's nothing. They, they don't correspond to reality. So they are not truth apt. We are literally just making words up like unicorn. Not a problem. So we can explain everything you just said and every all of the features that you want to say exist. I already think all of those exist other than prescriptions or, or normativity in the way that you describe it without any kind of need of a new ontology. So why do you need this new ontology? Like where, why does this? Oh. Okay. What I'm confused about is you're saying there are no prescriptions, right? They don't exist. That, that exist independent of imagination that correspond to reality other than ideas. Yes. Do you think that um, anything is good in the world? Yes. Don't use then I just take that, that to be a prescription. 
Okay, so goodness can be something like a law of nature. You don't need prescriptions there. Uh, sorry. So if I think that like cake is good, I just take that as a reason to eat the cake, a prescription. Okay, so you have a different view of morality than I do. Like, I would say that no. But do you disagree with that? Y yes, like that wouldn't be morality. Like it would be a prescription that you're okay, applying so to the desire. Like yes, so there you, are prescriptions. You have an idea. You want cake. Therefore, you think you should eat cake. Like, no, no requirement of any kind of truth happiness there. It's just your imagination doing all of that. Okay, wait. So you think that that follows that if you desire cake, you should eat the cake? You just said that. No, no. You think you should eat the cake. I think so. I could be wrong about my belief that I should eat the cake if I uh, desire it. You could be wrong about the claim, like the shouldness. Should you really eat the cake? That isn't contingent on your desire. So your desire doesn't make it true that you should eat the cake. It's just something you believe. So it makes your belief the case. You believe you should eat the case because you have the desire, but your desire to eat the cake does not make it true that you should, in fact, eat the cake. Okay, I see. So you're suggesting that if I desire to, if I desire to do X, that doesn't constitute any prescription. It constitutes. That's, that's, what that's what I take you to mean here. It doesn't constitute a prescription that exists as something true in reality. It constitutes a prescription as you language as a language thing that you've made up. You have made up a language thing that is a prescription that describes what you think you should do. So it's just a language. The, the prescription doesn't exist anywhere. It's just a feature of language that you've made up to describe your desire and nothing more. What I'm, what I'm trying to articulate is that you can derive um, a should or something that's good. We can get rid of the word should, right? Because of, like I said, it's problematic. They mean, it's not problematic. They just mean the same thing. The problem is that you're just not understanding the issue. So if you're saying that prescriptions and shoulds exist independent of minds or independent of language then that's I would not say, what i'm suggesting okay so if it's just made up in language that means it doesn't exist in that's reality not my, that's not my position so that, apparently that's your position right yes that's my, my position my position is that it's built into the notion of desire what is what does that mean it means that um if i desire x that entails given that desire the existence of the desire that entails a state which is this desire in which I, sh I should do something or X is good. Okay, that seems obviously false. Like animals have desires, but they don't have any shoulds or oughts. They have no should or ought language in there. That's just a contradiction on my view. Right, I understand that, but your view is silly or dumb. I'd just say it's dumb. Wait, okay, I'd say that so I don't, you don't wait, wait, so, so let, me, let me just expound on this. I'd say it's false that you need, or that prescriptions are entailed in desires. Desires are a brain state, nothing more, just a physical brain state, and that we make up prescriptions to describe those desires just because we have a, a, an ability to do that with language but there's no actual prescription entailed in the desire whatsoever yeah so what I, about your animal point right yes i you think that animals desire things let's say an, a, yes. a dog desires to eat dog food okay yes. i just think that necessarily implies the dog believes that the dog food is good if i don't know what it would mean to say that the that the dog desires dog food but it doesn't have the belief that the dog food is is good, right? I just that seems like a, that's a contradiction on my view, and that's and that's a very intuitive thing, right? That the idea is that when we express or we pred when we attribute a desire to something, we're, what we're attributing to that thing is that it takes mm. something else to be good. No, so so like the desires of lower animals don't entail this idea of goodness at all. They just have an innate intuitive thing that I want this. They don't know why they want it. They just want it. And so they haven't applied any good connotations to it because it seems like you're taking the idea of this desire and then applying some kind of higher order goodness thing to it when really that's just a language thing that again, we've made up or even if it exists, it doesn't, okay. it isn't entailed by just desire. Let me, let me outline the disagreement because I'm still not following. Are you saying that when a dog desires to eat dog food, that that doesn't imply that the dog takes dog food to be good. Is that what you're no, telling me? No, it doesn't okay, imply so it that doesn't, at all. It just has a desire. It doesn't know why it desires it. It doesn't have any higher order reasoning for why it desires it. And that would be required for what you're trying to argue. I just take good to be motivational, right? I mean, I take, I'm, I follow Bernard Williams. Okay, let me, let me let's just clarify for a second. So you're just saying any motivation requires dualism? Is that? Yeah. So if so, my view, if you if I attribute desires to dogs, 
they don't they're that their mental let's, states let's, are not i think that's the most clearest point we have right now so you think anything any motivation would require dualism like, i think that's clearly false i think you could have motivations just fine under physicalism why where is there a contradiction between having motivation i i just take motivation to imply desire and that's why i'm not talking about how electrons are motivated to move that's an equivocation right okay? right i'm not talking I'm, about i'm not talking about that i'm talking about animals so animals right uh lower animals ants have motivations bacteria probably might some like c elegans probably has motivations like those seem to be perfectly fine under physicalism why would you need dualism to explain any motivation just stick with the motivation language as much as possible right. it's okay, because it's because my what i take a motivation to be is to, is a desire right i don't see how you could be motivated to do something and have no desire to do it that doesn't make any sense uh so again like once we get down to bacteria or whatever they have motivations but no desires yeah so i don't know what that means what do you mean by motivation then they are compelled your... to do something through a neurological state but they have no conscious recognition of that they don't they don't understand it they don't have any beliefs they don't have any conscious experience but they still have a motivation which well, the is term neurological is problematic there because presumably little paramecium and amoebas don't have neurostates uh so c elegans has the smallest uh, brain 302 neurons so I'm, I'm including that's that then that range in general not being specific do you think amoebas I, i'm sorry you might probably know much more about biology than i do do amoebas have motivations uh, I don't know. I'm just going to go with just in that general area. There are things with neurons who have motivations that don't have desires. Okay. So I, I, on my view, I take, if something is motivated to do something, right. And not in the same sense, like just moving like an electron, right. It wants to do something. It desires to do something. Now that's what I mean by the term. What do you mean by the term? If you don't mean that. Uh, so, so I would say that there's a distinction between motivation and desire and that motivation is just like an intuitive impulse whereas desire is a conscious awareness that you're actually trying to accomplish something okay yeah it seems like you're just describing motivation and kind of dispositionally like in the way that electron is disposed to no nope, this would only apply to things with brains so things with brains have intuitions and desires are completely different okay well first of all do you think an in you said that a motivation is an intuitive impulse. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Now impulse, right? That's an, that's just, you know, electrons are, you can have, you can use that notion of impulse and apply it to things that have no motivations, right? Okay. So, let me give you like an example. So like, uh, if I have a twitch in my leg, I like move my leg. Like I didn't desire to move my leg. I didn't have like, I think it's good to move my leg. I just did it. I was like, that's annoying and did it. Um, or sneezing, same thing. Sneezing would be an impulse or uh mm -hmm. motivation i'm motivated to sneeze whether i want to or not and Wait, i didn't think it was good do you think that if okay I, and just just to make sure we agree that desire and wanting are like are synonymous for the for the, our purposes right sure because I, I take those to be synonymous if you yeah. desire something you want it right sure. yep okay okay so you're yeah i don't think that um i'm motivated to do anything when um the doctor does the little reflex tap on my knee that's that's just dispositional that's not that much different than what's going on with the behavior of electrons in the sense that there's just dispositions that are going on independent of what my, what i want to do or what i desire to do so in that case a motivation there is just not going to track desire that's okay fine, so it seems right? like what you're saying is that just any kind of conscious state that you want something can only be accounted for by dualism and not materialism yeah, I, I'm saying that intentional states right now, I understand the qualitative states and there are separate arguments for that, but I'm talking about beliefs and desires and desires are probably the most obvious, you know, their beliefs are a little bit more difficult to demonstrate that they're non-natural, um, but desires are rather apparent for me given normative, the irreducible. So I see no difference. Of... I see no difference between beliefs and desires. I see them as exactly desires as a subset of beliefs. So if beliefs are explained physically, then so are desires. What, you take beliefs to, beliefs to be a, a subset of desires? Is that what I heard? No, desires are a subset of beliefs. Yeah, I'm fine with that, but I think this is useful. Wait, wait, so, so what you said was is that it's harder to show beliefs are non-physical than desires. Right. I think I think I, I would have to do a little bit more work. Right, right. So, so just let's, let's stick with that. So that would accurately, I would agree. So I would say that, yes, um, we can, it's, beliefs are probably physical under my view, or pretty much probably. guaranteed. 
Okay. Yeah, I always give something. I never say anything with absolute certainty. I like just give it percentage. So uh, if beliefs are probably physical and desires are a subset of beliefs, desires are also physical. So if you want to say that desires are non-physical, then you would have to show beliefs are non-physical. Well, I, I just take desire to be a type of belief. And I'm just saying that there's an intuitive, intuitive um, intuitions that I could utilize to show why they're not natural. The intuitions are sort of lost at, um, because like, I think, well, I, was reading... I, I think intuitions don't tell us anything about the fundamental nature of reality anyway. They're just garbage, but it, go, go back to what I go back to what I said. So for me, if beliefs are not, are physical and desires are beliefs, then desires are necessarily physical. So if all beliefs are physical, desires are beliefs, desires are physical. So you would have to show beliefs themselves or some part of beliefs could in some way not be physical. And that's the part, because I see them as synonymous. Desires, yeah, beliefs, I, I, There's if you can't show beliefs are non-physical, then you can't show desires are non-physical. Well, look, I, I wanted to finish what I said because what I was all I was trying to say is that it's easier to see why desires are non-natural than just beliefs simpliciter, right? That's, it's no, 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 not- In your view, in your view, that's finish. the case. I just think that's finish. false. Show me just right, beliefs. I'd like to finish my sentence, okay? Because then there was confusion if you cut me off. What I'm trying to say is that I'm not presenting an argument for why, um, you know, desires are like have the special property that beliefs don't have, because I think they share a property that makes them non-physical. I'm just starting with beliefs because I think it's easier for the audience to understand why desires are so apparently non-natural than as compared to beliefs. But I can start with beliefs. Yes, right? that's and what that's, I'm asking. Do, do that. Okay. So the idea is that when you believe X, right, that's a commitment to X being true. Okay. You're con so if I believe that it's raining outside... I'm committed to that truth that it's raining outside, okay? Now, the first thing is that I could fail, okay? The second thing is that it in the commitment that I believe X, right, I shouldn't believe not X given that commitment. Commitment. So that's, that's just to say that if we want to eliminate the word should, we could express it that it's good to not believe the, contra, uh, the, the um, opposite or the negation of X given that I'm committed um to x in the first place right so that's why um beliefs are non-natural in my view because they're considered to be um expressions of what we should believe what what um we shouldn't believe what's good to believe what's not good to believe in other words okay so yeah, none of that is necessary in belief at all so i can just say all of that is just secondary language you've made up to describe just anyone believing something is true so all that's just gibberish Wait. okay so you think it's gibberish to say that if I believe that it's raining outside, that I'm committed to thinking that it's raining outside? No, to say that if I believe it's raining outside, therefore I also believe I should not believe it's not raining outside. No, like you don't need that kind of Wait, complex. You're jumping, analytic... you're jumping into the, further into the argument. Just start yeah. with the, the first part, okay? Let's do one step at a time because you're jumping premises. Do okay. you believe that it's gibberish to say that if I believe in X, that I'm committed to X being true? Do you think that's gibberish? Uh. If you believe in X, then you believe it's true. Yes. Well, you're, uh, uh, use my terminology because you're trying to communicate. No, I, I don't want to use your terminology because your terminology is gibberish. Then you're not interested in my argument. No, so I'm, I'm going to rephrase your argument in my terminology and how I understand it. Okay, this. that's fair. Try again. So if you believe X, you believe X is true. Yes. Yeah, if I believe I, uh, X, I believe X is true. That doesn't inform anyone of anything about what a belief is, T-Jump. You're better okay. than this. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're saying here. If we're trying to um, break down what a belief is, I'm being informative and expressing that beliefs are in commitment. But you're not when you're just saying, I believe I don't X. know what you mean by it, commitment. Like a belief is just a belief. So you, you believe something is true about reality. Like this is pretty self-evident. It's not like you need a, a super, do you want me just to pull up the dictionary definition of belief? I'm only interested in what you mean, not what the dictionary means. I mean what the dictionary means. Oh, okay. So do you have to look up in the dictionary for what you yeah, mean yes. by a term? What, what is what is it belief? Just look up the dic Are you like really, it's so obvious. You don't know what you mean by a Oops. term? You have to look it up. It's like, is it that? Yeah, it's, the it's so obvious and so commonly used that people don't normally it's have to It's so ask obvious, it. but you're, gonna, you're having to look acceptance it up. Acceptance of a statement being true. Like, oh God, so hard. Yeah. So acceptance means that if I accept X, I'm committed to X being true. That doesn't seem impossible. Yeah, I, I have no idea what you mean by committed here. It's just a synonym. Committed and belief are synonyms. So like this doesn't add any contact whatsoever to you to your argument so yeah if you believe x you believe it's true because uh commitments and acceptance and belief are synonyms okay right but the idea of a com so if you think that using your notion of commitment okay if i'm committed to eating breakfast 
in the morning every day, okay? Do you think that we can derive that it's good to eat breakfast in the morning every day from no. just that truth? No. Okay, then I don't know what you mean by commitment in that case. Commitment has nothing to do with good. I could be committed to uh, drowning babies. That doesn't mean it's good to drown babies or that I should drown babies. Look, I understand that. Okay, then the <laughs> do you think that you should be committed to good things or bad things? Uh, neither. Like, you can be committed to whatever you want. Like... Like you choosing what you want to be committed to is a completely separate topic. Like being committed to something doesn't make it good or doesn't imply goodness. You could be okay, committed so to anything you want and that wanting it doesn't make it good. Let's just rewind. You, you express that belief, commitment, and acceptance are synonyms, right? Sure. Okay. So then when I said that to believe that um, X is true is to be committed to X as being true, sure. right? Okay. So that wasn't, that part wasn't gibberish. You said that the, where was the, well, it's a tautology. Part? You're saying the same thing twice, which is why I just said, of course, believe... it's an illogical, where I'm, I'm analyzing the analytic philosophy is in the business of what things mean. Okay. So we're going to get tautologies, right? Okay. Yes. It's a tautology so, to so... say that, a, 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 let me finish. It's a tautology to say that an unmarried man is a bachelor. That's a tautology. That's necessarily true. In the same way that it's an, a tautology to say that if I believe X, I'm committed to X being true. Okay. Are we established? Yes. That's why I just moved belief to both spaces because it's a tautology to make sure that's what you were meaning and didn't have some kind of extra baggage meaning and commitments there that wasn't just entailed by the definition of belief yes that was okay the whole point. so now now the question is what f can we further derive from commitments and i'm of the i'm of the view that something is good if and only and if if and only if i'm committed to it to to it right that's the subjectivist picture now i understand that you're you're a realist about the good so good is independent in some sense of our beliefs and desires right yes but the, that's fine that's what you take morality to be but even some um moral objectivists are going to express that when we have reasons um to do something right we are expressing what we're committed to and that and and morality can be over and above that right so sure. that's just to say that there are two types of shoulds here two types right. of goods right and we don't want to equivocate right so okay? so we, let's take take the example of uh I think I should drown babies. There is an ought in that statement. I, I am committed to drowning babies. Now, obviously, that's not the same as the good. The good is a separate kind of an ought there. The good, in my case, is an objective kind of ought. It exists independently of our opinions. It is something that is true about reality, whereas the ought that I feel I should drown babies is a subjective kind. It's made up by my imagination and doesn't exist in reality in any independent way. It's a made-up figment of my imagination. Okay, so there's then there's two... Cent I, I mean... It, it, I don't. I, I don't want to talk past you, right? When I say, yeah. because I, I'm not a moral realist, or not in the, not the same kind of moral realist as you are. I think that when I say the cake is good, I'm expressing my desire to eat the cake. Okay. Okay. Now, so, when so you, did, did, would you agree with my example that there are these two kinds of shoulds? There's an objective kind of should that exists in the no. imagination. No, okay. I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of a, um, I have an intermediate view. Um, I think that I distinguish value and commitment. Right, so I think that when I am predicating goodness of a cake, I'm I, that's value in the cake, but that ex, that's motivating me to have some kind of commitment to do. So, it, so do if it. I value drowning babies, there's actual value in drowning babies. Under under my view, yes, yeah, yeah, that's the tautology. You would agree to that? No. So I would say that there is a subjective thing that you've applied there, which isn't a real value. So if there's like, when I, when I made this distinction between the two kinds of shoulds, there's an objective kind, which is real value. There's an objective value there. So there's an objective value in not imposing on other wills. That would be an objective value. There is real value there. But this case where I feel this commitment that I should drown babies, there's not real value there. There's just synthetic value you've made it up it's a psychological state that has no correspondence to reality whatsoever and so these two kinds of oughts are different things in my worldview one is purely easily explained by you have a brain state that makes you want to drown babies and, and then you apply language to it to make it an ought statement but there's no truth there's no actual value there at all um whereas in the objective moral sense there is real value in that one so to me when when you say that any kind of commitment uh, requires this value thing, I would say that's just obviously false. Like any kind of commitment I feel is just a desire, a brain state, some, a biological feature of neurology and nothing more that is perfectly easy to explain, 
naturally. And then if you want to talk about this objective sense of value, the objective morality, that's much harder to explain naturally. Um, but both are perfectly fine to explain as physical, natural stuff without a dualism. Right. Okay, so, um, you know, we don't, we could debate morality, right? But I just want to get back to dualism. But I, I think what you're saying is totally relevant to, to dualism. I just have to tie it in, okay? Yeah. You said there's a distinction between objective and subjective value. But the point is, is that there are two kinds of value, right? So if someone is serial killer, let's say, sees value in killing someone for pleasure, for mere pleasure, right? There is a sense of value that we can attribute to killing someone, but it's not going to be the, you know, capital um, right. D value, right? And I'm saying that there's a common property between objective value and subjective value, and I'm granting objective value, right, in the sense, in, right. in the same sense that you are, right? And that common property, right, is ought, you know, or good, okay? Okay. Um, we can get rid of odd if you want to, but there's good. Uh, there, the point is, is that if you think there's a common property between objective and subjective value, right? I want to know what that is because you're saying that what it's not is this um, general notion of good. Okay, that's what I'm interested in. Uh, yeah. So, so you're saying that just using the drowning babies example, there's the value. There's some kind of oughtness in this drowning babies example. Now, I see nothing in this example that can't be explained by physicalism. Person A has a brain state. Person A's brain state causes them to want to drown babies. There is no objective value. They just apply this value language that they want to do X, and then they describe it as being a real thing. I see no problem with this being purely physical. Why is this? Why would you yeah, need dualism for this? what I'm trying to this? say is that whether it's capital G good or right, little... So, so we, we've gotten rid of all the capital G good. We're only talking about the subjective G good, that there's this person who wants to drown babies. Everything in this example seems perfectly well explained under physical materialism. Okay. Why wouldn't it be? What What is right? So we have little g good then. Okay. Yeah. I'm saying that I still Hume's concerns still apply here. Okay. There's a distinction between little g good and any descriptive state like what is happening, right? Because there's an open question of what is happening as being little g good or not little b little g good, right? And that's why I take um, something like beliefs and desires, right? to be distinguished from those sort of descriptive states in the brain. Okay, so I'm still not seeing any... So everything in this example is perfectly well explained by physicalism. What... And you're saying... You just keep saying that, no, something isn't. But I want to know what the something is that isn't. Maybe we could focus on a premise because I didn't hear you articulate a specific a rebuttal to any of what I just said. I didn't hear any of what you just said being relevant to what I asked. So again, so I'm saying everything in this example, person A wants to drown babies. They feel a desire to drown babies. They make up words like oughtness to describe that. There is no actual oughtness. Um, it's just they've made up a language to it. It's just a desire caused by a brain state, nothing more that's purely physical. Where do we need something other than physical here? It just doesn't seem to be responding to what I'm saying, right? What I'm saying is basically Moore's concern, right? The open question argument. Right. That's what I'm saying, that the natural state of your brain, there's an open question as to whether it should be happening or it's expressing a good thing. Right. Because what more D.E. Moore was pointing out is that there is an analytic difference. There's a conceptual difference between right uh, goodness and a descriptive thing like what is happening in my head. Yeah, right. Yes. So that's just a question of ontology. Like, is there actual real goodness that exists in this situation? If you say no, then that good GE's open question argument doesn't apply to the brain state of the individual who wants to drown babies. You just say there isn't a good there. It's not. So his desire Remember, to have good... We're talking about subjective good, right? Right, right, we're right. About... right. So, so this, is, this is why I brought up this distinction is because the is-ought problem and GE Moore's open question argument don't apply to desires for good because there isn't any good in those desires. It's just an, a subjective made up prescription. There is no good, there is no value, there is no anything but in you those. Accept wait, 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 wait. So, so okay. this is the thing, when we're talking about GE, the, the open question argument and the is art problem, they only care about the objective good. They have nothing to do with your subjective good that we're talking about now. It's completely irrelevant. They don't have a problem with a desire for good because that's purely a psychological state. They only apply if there is an actual objective good there, not a psychological state of desiring good. So, so those arguments that you keep bringing up don't actually have an issue with people wanting something. Like those aren't those aren't problems that the is ought problem would apply to. 
Yeah, so you're 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 right. Historically, Moore was saying that you couldn't reduce goodness to desires, pain, and pleasure. Right. What yeah. I'm doing is I'm saying that Moore was on the right track by attacking things like the utilitarian principle, like the objective principles, right, that were descriptive. Um, but I think he was wrong to extend the argument all the way down to desires and notions like pain and pleasure, right? So there is a, there's a truth to what you said. The original ar open question argument was an attack on people that were equating good to desire. But I'm saying that we can, no, we can extend it to, to, to um, we can include desires, pain, and pleasure to um, our concept of goodness because of you're, you admitted that there is this notion of subjective good that's rooted in our desires, right? And the only yeah. way it could be grounded or identical to that is that if you either breach the is ought gap, which I don't think that that would be invalid given Hume's concerns, or if desires themselves have a built in notion of subjective good, little g good. Yes. Yeah, so, so I, so like you're taking G.E. Moore's argument and you're applying it from an objective standpoint to just any belief about good. And that seems completely backwards to me. So I don't see how that would be, how G.E. Moore's argument would apply to a subjective perception of goodness. Just the fact that we have an idea of goodness doesn't mean that that idea of goodness can't come from physical states. If a physical brain can like make up things that don't exist, like unicorns, why can't it make up other things that don't exist, like prescriptive values? Yeah. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm going to rephrase, I'm going to introduce, I didn't really give an account of the open question arguments. So the audience is probably a little confused, but maybe we can agree on, um, on what, well, first thing is I'm not saying that I'm giving Moore's exact argument. His right. exact argument, like you said, goes against what I'm trying to say. Okay. I'm getting the essence of the argument, the essence of the open question argument. And all the open question argument is that when we ask the question, right, um, X is happening, but is it good? One way to tell whether X is um, a normative notion is to know whether you could possibly answer yes or no, or necessarily always answer yes. So by example, right? If, um, if it's beneficial, well, if X is beneficial, if that's true, does it follow? Is it good if it's beneficial? Well, of course it's good if it's beneficial because beneficial and good are synonyms to say X is good would entail like, uh, sorry, to say X is beneficial would entail X is good. Now watch this. If I say, if X is bleeding, okay, if X is bleeding, um, uh, is that good? Well, there's a, a, a real open question because there are cases in which bleeding is good and there are cases in which bleeding is bad. So we understand the notion of bleeding there as not being a normative notion, okay? Now try it with desire, right? X is desirable. Now, is it good? Moore would say it, it's either yes or no, right? There's some desires that are good and some desires that are not good. This is what you were saying, right? What I'm just saying is that given our, if we flesh out the notion of desire, all things being equal, it's always going to give us a yes because desires, right, express the same um, sentiments, I mean, meaningful sentiments as are my notion of good, right? They're analytically equivalent. Uh, case in point, if I desire to do something, right, doesn't mean that I'm going to be successful or fail. fail. I'm not going to be, uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to fail or succeed with respect to it. In the same way that if it's good to do something, that doesn't mean that whatever is going to happen is going to conform to it or not conform to it, right? So that's a hallmark of normativity. That's like the red flag of I'm a normative thing, right? So I just take desires to be normative. Can you desire to do something you know is bad? No, not all things being equal, no. So I think the criminal justice system would disagree. Um, but so, so the reason that G.E. Moore's argument and the Izzat problem aren't applied in the way that you're applying them is because people normally think that you, because the human mind can make stuff up, it can also make up desires, just other, which is just more making stuff up. And that's perfectly fine. Like th there wouldn't be a contradiction with us just making up with our brains things that don't exist, including this desire uh, thing. So this desire thing could just be a figment of our imagination, and there wouldn't be a contradiction with a figment of our imagination not representing with reality and still being purely made of physical stuff. So I don't see there that I don't think that argument would be able to be applied in the way you're applying. I don't see why we would think that the fact that we can imagine prescriptive states would 
imply that these prescriptive states actually exist. Like, well, it's, well, I, go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. So, so yeah, because it seems like that what you're saying is, is that because we have an imagination of prescriptive states, prescriptive states must exist at least as an imaginary thing, and therefore because physical things can't produce prescriptive states there must be this new ontology to account for these imagined prescriptive states, something like that. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I think if I imagine something that that something isn't really intentional. Um, like if I imagine a unicorn, that unicorn isn't intentional. What I'm saying is that the notion of good, little g good, right, is built into intention itself. I, I don't know what that means. So how is imagining that I think drowning babies is good uh, any different from imagining a unicorn. Okay, just to explain it, I know you're not a subjectivist, but you understand the program of subjectivism, right? They want to say that the conditions for doing the right thing, right, is that if you have a reason to do the right thing, reasons are internal, they're not external, right? So we're not, we're, go by Kant, right? Okay, reasons are internal. To say that I have an internal reason is to suggest that I either have a belief or desire, okay? That's a subjectivist program. So that's to say that if you're a subjectivist, right, you've taken X is right thing to do all the way, logically speaking, to an internal, mental, intentional state, namely a desire, okay? That is what, now, if you're a realist like yourself, right, you can still make sense of that, right? Sure. You're just saying that there's there's rightness and there's morally right or something, yeah. okay? Right? So I'm just saying that what the, the common property between rightness and morally right is that there is still built in both notions, right, is goodness, right? And we want to distinguish that from non-goodness, which is descriptive. Sure, sure. So that, that I would just lead back to my example. Can you desire to do something you know is not good? Yes, like you can desire to drown babies. That is a perfectly Not all things reasonable... being equal, though. Okay, wait. Do you, okay, I know you don't believe it. If, if you're, pretend you're a subjectivist, would you still answer the way you did? Uh, well, I think subjectivist is defeated by like this argument. So I, I, I we can we can we can um, grant that. But I'm just saying that you know a subjectivist right is only going to understand goodness in terms of internal states. Right. Okay? Right. So yes, okay. I, I understand that if I was a subjectivist, if I believed the same things they did, I would probably disagree, and that's perfectly fine. I think okay. subjectivists are wrong because they can't answer this question coherently. So, right. You want to say that something like eating babies or whatever you suggested is always or objectively bad in some kind of way, right? Yes. And so okay. if you, you, so you can, and you can know it's bad. So people, or if they can just have subjectively know it's bad to drown or eat babies, but they can still desire to drown and eat babies. Like people can know something is wrong and bad and still desire to do it all the time. Like that's a, that's a really common thing. So, you want to say something, Converse? Yeah, you guys, one second. Um, so I, we've got um, – I've been checking out uh, the chat, and there are some questions coming in. So I thought maybe here in about like maybe 20 minutes or something like that, we'll go to some questions. And uh, th that way – that might help us clarify. But um, you guys were talking with Danny from the Phil Talk YouTube channel and T-Jump from the T-Jump YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with them, check out their channels. Um T-Jump is taking the position that uh, materialism or uh, naturalism is the case, and Danny is taking the opposite. Um, so if you want, can can when you guys just, for people who are just tuning in, kind of talk about where you are at in the conversation right now, just kind of summarize it, and then you can get right back on track. Okay. Well, first thing is that um, I'm on stream, and I'm seeing that it's ended. Are we live streaming? Yeah, um, it, it is. Sorry if that's stuck up there. Um, I hit uh, something on my side that I didn't mean to, and then I, I just ended okay. it. But yeah, yeah T-Jump streaming it live. Yeah, I'm streaming and... it live on my channel. It has okay. Um, now, T-Jump can interrupt me. I'm going to try. Uh, so if I mischaracterize you, but you wanted a summary of what was, what was going on, right? But here's the, the summary is that I'm, I'm a non-naturalist, mainly on account of the idea that I think that, number one, there's a distinction between any sense of good with a descriptive thing or like like a, for example a natural thing and if that is true we could if i could substantiate that okay um then that mean then i can further my argument to express that our desires and beliefs express that notion of good that is namely distinct from descriptions like what is happening right because science take science i take science to be 
um, a kind of methodology that's getting at what is the case in the natural world, which is descriptive. It, science doesn't tell us what we should do, or what we shouldn't do, right? Because it's not in the business of explaining or um, giving a meaningful account of goodness, shouldness, rightness, moral, on my view, right? I know T. Jump disagrees. Um, and um, and so if it's if, if science is in the business, to summarize, if science is in the business of approaching the natural world, and the natural world is descriptive, and it's not really talking about shoulds and goodness and right and wrong, then I just don't think that um, that uh, that things like good or bad or anything like that is going to be approachable by the sciences. And so because it's wholly not those things, natural things, right? That's if you want to summarize it your own way. I don't know. Uh, well, actually, somebody sent me a super chat they wanted to ask you for Danny. Does it give you pause as a dualist that everything else in the universe has a physical cause rather than a mental cause from raw nakedness? Yeah, but that for me, that begs the question, right? If, if, you, if you're right about that, then I'm just wrong, right? But I don't think I'm wrong. So I just, I'm going to dispute that everything, everything is, there's causal closure of the physical, right? What you're basically asking me is given causal closure of the physical, well, how can dualism be true, right? And I, I'm, I accept that if there's causal closure of the physical, dualism is false. So it's, it's precisely actually, why I do. it's an inductive argument. So it's saying everything we've discovered so far is indicated by physicalism. Therefore, it's reasonable to infer things we don't know, like consciousness or intentionality, could also be other physical things we just haven't discovered yet. So it's an inductive argument. It's not asking for closure about everything. Oh, okay. Well, the the point is is that I've I've attempted at least right to present a deductive argument, right? And if it's the case that I'm successful, right, I, I mean, I'm, I'm successful unto myself at the least, right, that I'm presenting a deductive argument for why there's a distinction between intentionality and non-intentionality, like natural states, right, then induction just doesn't matter. Okay, uh, thanks for answering the question. Um, so to go back to the topic, so I was asking, people can desire to do things that are bad, that they know are bad. Um, and... I don't know if this would actually be a defeater for your position or not. So you, so you would say that, like, so there's the objective bad. So this is objectively bad for them to want to do this. And they know it's objectively bad, but they subjectively want to do it. So from a subjectivist definition, it still entails some goodness or something, some subjective goodness. And that subjective goodness thingy. I lost even, you there. Can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. So... There's objective goodness and subjective goodness. Someone wants to drown babies. That's objectively bad. So they're wrong. There is literally not goodness in this argument, but they have a subject, but in their subjective de desire, it is defined as goodness in the subjectivist worldview because they have a subjective desire of some kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is a point to what you're saying. And um, I think it, I, I don't know if it's tangential. You can, you can decide if it's not, but um, the point is, is that uh, if, if I'm agreeing to an objective sense of value, then when someone thinks X is good, on my view, I take goodness to be a posteriori, a posteriori, sorry, okay? So I think that like when you are, let's say walking, uh, taking a walk and you see a drowning kid, right? There, and you see that you're motivated to like save them, right? There's something about that situation that you're seeing, right? I'm what you call, uh, I'm very sympathetic to sensibility theory. so. People like um, uh, McDowell, John McDowell, um, Wiggins, uh, David Wiggins, right? These are sensibility theorists. My view is something like it. The idea is I take, if we can be wrong about what's valuable or what's good, it's on the perceptual level, not on the like reasoning level, right? But I don't know. Some people think that you can just reason to these things. Um, presumably Kant, right, thinks that there's a large extent in which you could reason to what's good I'm not of that persuasion. I think that goodness is a, a ultimately starts with a, a kind of empirical thing where you're seeing this value or value. Okay. I think that might be a tangent, but the, the point, I, I forgot your original question, my bad. So my question, because you, you claimed that you, if you desire to do anything, it must inherently entail some goodness just by definition. I'm you could be misperceiving. I'm, I'm saying that there could be a misperception, right? So if I if the walking person walks by the drowning child, looks at all the physical things, they can know that they're not getting enough oxygen, that there's water being splashed, you know, that there's a human being in the water, all this thing. But they're just not motivated to do anything, and they continue on their walk. I might be inclined to say that they're misperceiving 
um, something. But uh, that's contentious, and I'm not prepared to to discuss that. I think it's tangential to yeah, our yeah, history. yeah. So, so okay. my focus is on the desire part of the person who wants to drown the babies. Like, you get they're objectively wrong. So, objectively, a posteriori, they have a desire, and that desire is wrong. Perfectly fine. But you're claiming that in that desire itself, there is still some goodness, prescriptive oughtness of some kind. Yeah. So, I mean, I just don't think that if I desire X and I, I take that to be the belief that X is good, right? Now, you disagree with that, apparently, right? I think, I think you expressed disagreement. Okay. And if you're saying what you're doing there is you're predicating X, which is a thing outside of yourself, um, of, of, uh, you're predicating goodness of that thing, right? Which is a kind of realist picture. Yeah. Okay. But I'm saying the commitment, the motivation that explains my behavior, that's internal, right? I don't think that the value out there is a reason. I think the, va do you, you want to stop me there? Did I lose you? No. Uh, so the motive, the internal motivation, internal motivation requires dualism. Right, because I think, remember, on my view, internal motivation are reasons. I have, if I'm motivated to do X, I have a reason to do X, I have a reason to do X. Reasons are either beliefs or desires, or beliefs are simpliciter, right? I just don't know what a reason would be outside of a belief. Okay, can someone use an electrode, shock your brain, and cause you to have a desire? Yes. And that wouldn't indicate that desires are more likely physical? Well, not given my my argument, no. I could see why. So there, the, I, I grant you the intuition. Like, here's the idea is that if I stick my fingers in your brain or if I shoot you in the head, no more, it seems like there's no more mental life, right? So yep. then the intuition is that we're, that the mental life is in the head, right? But I'm saying that if we're being responsible, what's happening here is that there's a mere correlation there's the event in which I put a bullet through your brain, and then the event in which there's no mental life, and that doesn't establish identity. Right, it doesn't prove it deductively, because we could be in the matrix or whatever. But uh, it does show it with a high level of inductive certainty, which I think gives us a stronger basis to conclude it is physical rather than us being in a brain in a vet, which is possible. Look, I might accept that, but given the arguments that I'm trying to articulate here, you're, I think that one should be committed to deduction, right? Um, the fact that there's a meaningful distinct, these, mean, these distinctions I'm giving would render us to cast aside those probabilities because probability does not trump a deductive argument. Now, I understand you don't accept my argument, but- well, I, would, I disagree with that. Just So I'd say that probability does trump a deductive argument. Deductive arguments are just our preconceived imaginings of things and they don't really tell us about reality at all. And the inductive thing, which does refer to reality is supersedes that in all cases, I would say. Uh, but that slightly separate topic. Um, so what is it you that you- I mean, it may not matter, but- what? Would you that, ask? I, that you don't, I, I might agree with you that, that we might disagree there, but I'm not so sure it's relevant to our discussion. Uh, well, if we agree that the inductive argument supersedes the deductive argument and the inductive argument indicates that the brain okay. is physical, then it, then it would. Yeah, I just don't, I, I mean, again, I'm bringing in Hume here with the in, in problem of induction, right? There's not a problem of deduction. There's a problem of induction. Why is there a problem of induction? It's because inductive arguments don't are not guaranteed by the premises deductions are deductive arguments are and uh, that notion of guarantee yeah sure so given an analytic statement that's true but deductive arguments don't tell us anything about reality inductive arguments do they have far more pragmatic success so we can just say yeah inductive arguments supersede deductive in all cases until you can start using deductive arguments to build cities wait wait, wait, wait look look do you think that if i told you my friend is a bachelor um you wouldn't know that he's male from that that seems, look, the idea that he's that male? I, yeah. Bachelors uh, are unmarried men. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> man. Uh, I don't know. Nope, because of transgenderism. So, uh, but the, the point here is that uh, if we can't use deductive reasoning to tell us about reality, because deductive reasoning only tells us, given our previous beliefs, if our previous beliefs are true, then this would be true. But to know if our previous beliefs are true, Induction is the only thing you can do. If, if you want a sound argument, you need induction. 
uh, you can't like if you want something to tell us about the world, you can't just use analytic statements. Analytic statements can't tell us about the world. You need some reference in the world. But I, just gave, I just gave you a counter example. I told you that my friend is a bachelor. You can infer that there's something true in the world, namely that there's a man in the world, right? Uh, no, I could just, it's possible that your, by your definition is wrong. Like, like suppose man is some what? objective feature of the world. Like there's man is something. I can't be wrong about what wait, I mean wait, by wait, 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 I don't care what you mean because I care about what's true about the That's world. So, so wait, is. stop, stop. I don't, the de again, the definitions are irrelevant. I don't care about definitions. I care about reality and your definitions may or may not correspond to reality. So what matters is reality, not your definitions. So saying something is true by definition tells us nothing about reality. I could say there is a square circle is a, is a married bachelor or whatever. Um, or, or I could say a square circle is a pink potato. Does that mean there is a pink potato? Does a square circle exist? Well, no, because it's false. Or I could say a cat is a dog. I can just define a cat as a dog. Does that mean that a cat is a dog in reality? No. So definitions tell us nothing about reality at all. Definitions are things we've made up in our heads. And what matters is whether or not we can show those definitions correspond to reality. And the method to do that is induction, not deduction. Yeah, this, this just simply cannot be true because I've told people, um, yeah, I'm a bachelor. And what I've done there is I've informed them that I'm unmarried, right? And they, they concluded that not an on an inductive basis, they've done, done that on a deductive basis. So they know when I tell someone that I'm a bachelor, which by the way, I just got married, so I'm no longer a bachelor. <laughs> but, um, I, if I tell them that I'm a bachelor, I'm informing them something true about the world, namely that I'm unmarried. No, that's all induction. That. So, so that's all induction of how the words are used in their language and in their context. The deductive argument or the definition there was built on inductive usage of the language. So the reason they know that you're a man is because that's how the words have been used in their culture and how they were taught inductively, which has changed in recent years. So um, that would not be the case. So, so the induction there still supersedes the deduction. So if you want to take two examples, say one person tells two people that they're a married bachelor and one person is just using the deductive definitions of the terms and the other person is using the inductive examples of say like uh, trans women um, and they're defining, just defining a man as a biological man, then you could say that if using the deductive argument would give you the wrong conclusion. You'd say, this person says I am a, a bachelor and you infer that they are a man from that, but biologically they are a woman. You would actually have gotten the wrong answer by using deduction where you would have gotten the right answer by using induction. So induction would supersede deduction using that example. Yeah, the most charitable way I can understand this is that sometimes the premises are supported inductively but the conclusion is given deductively, right? So if I say something like, you know, if I say that I'm a, a, a bachelor, you're, you might be using induction in terms of knowing that we're using the same sense of the same term bachelor. We're using the term bachelor in the same way, right? But still, once that's established and named, you know, to your credit, inductively, then they know something about the world in terms of me being unmarried. But um, I'll rest my case on that one. Okay, so, so I would still say that given the choice between analyzing an argument using an inductive basis or a deductive basis, the inductive basis is going to give you a better description of reality. The deductive basis is just telling you what someone already believes. Um, it's, it's only telling you about the beliefs the person already has. The inductive basis is telling you something about reality. All right. I, I, like I said, I've rested my case. Thank okay, that, that's fine. Oh, you're muted. You muted. Um... Converse. Converse. Yeah, sorry about that. My uh, mic was unmuted, but my uh, computer was still muted. All right. So that's a good place to stop. Um, we have some questions from the audience. This might actually help to clarify some things as well. And um, so that, that'll be a good thing to start with. Um, you guys, I, I put together this discussion because I thought Denny's a good philosophical thinker. So is T-Jump. They take different positions on this. They both are, are atheists, so there can't be any like, oh, you believe this because of that or whatever, right? It's going to be just straight up discussion of the topic. And I thought, man, this will make a really good discussion. So I hope you guys agree with that. You'll be surprised. Um, uh, people to sometimes say, call me a closeted theist. That's how bad. So that even if the, the label atheist is sometimes not enough, they'll just call you <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've, I've seen before where, where people have said like, um, oh, I wonder why he believes that, you know, and then somebody was like, well, he's an atheist, so I wonder too. 
And they're like, oh, he's an atheist. Okay, well, so that is interesting. And that's why I thought this would make an interesting discussion. So um, the first question I've seen says, um, so morality exists, therefore a soul. And that was for Dehenny, but I'm not sure if that's... I don't yeah. accept the existence of souls. I'm, I, I think Descartes and I, I reject substance theory. So um, Cartesian dualism doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so uh, no, I don't. I think that the mind, um, like they want to say that there's a distinction between the mind and the soul. I reject the whole category of soul. So I think there's mind and body, not mind and body and soul. So it'd be fair to say you're just you're not a substance dualist, although you're right. a dualist. Yeah. Okay. Next question from Gavin Herleman says, if the mind is part of the brain, why can't neurosurgeons see, in quotation marks, the mind in the brain or extract, in quotation marks, the mind from the brain? Uh, because, That's strategic. Because it's an arbitrary relation. Like if you look at a chessboard, can you see who's winning just by analyzing the pieces? Well, well, no, because there's an arbitrary relation between the system of the game and the board itself. The same thing is happening in the mind. There's an arbitrary relation between the picture in your mind, the, the image, and its relation to the neurons, which is completely made up by evolution. And so until we can decipher the way in which that happens, there's no way we can actually see the image to be able to do what Gavin is asking. So the reason we can't see it is the same reason you can't see who's winning on the chessboard unless you know the rules of chess. All right, thanks for that. Ryan Hamilton had a question. It says, um, has Denny ever heard of idealism? Why is he thinking that dualism is the best explanation? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, sure, no problem. Has Denny ever heard of idealism why is he thinking that dualism is the best explanation? Yeah, so you could, first of all, there are different kinds of idealism. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, the Kantian notion of idealism is very different than the Barclian. Um, you can be a dualist and not be an idealist. You can be an idealist and not be a dualist. Um, and, and then you can be both, right? Um, so, but I'm somewhat persuaded by a sort of Kantian form of idealism. Um, and uh, that is compatible with dualism, right? All right, thanks so much for that. Our next question says, demonstrate a mind which can operate without a physical brain. If you cannot, then babbling about Hume has no value. Yeah, demonstrate. So I don't know what follows from this. So let's say you're asking me to demonstrate a mind without a body or without a brain or something like that. Well, in the first place, I think there is a dependency relation between mind and body. I just think they're ontologically different. So I don't, I'm a little bit skeptical of disembodied minds. So I'm in agreement with that, but I don't think there's a law about what can have a mind or what can't have a mind, right? It's perfectly logical for the creators of Toy Story to give minds to things that didn't have brains, right? Woody doesn't have a brain. But when we thought that in the story that he could, you know, that he believed things, he desired things, it wasn't like, we weren't logical fools for thinking that, right? So that's just a, that's just a, a basic conceivability argument that I, I don't have to demonstrate anything in the actual world, but the, by the fact that I can conceive of a toy having a mind shows that the mind is not identical, at least conceptually, to a brain. Uh, I got okay. a question, uh, super chat on mine from Florio. Ontological status of transgenderism for T jump. Um, I think it's a psychological state. That would be my position. All right, thanks for that. Our next question is for T jump as well. Um, Digital Gnosis says, I think you might be begging the question, T jump. He said, if, if we program a computer to have it have AI, then it would have oughts. There is so much in that. If he is assuming intentional states and normativity are possible, uh, they he is. So, uh, yeah, the last part so, of the question is kind so, of... So uh, my position is that if we can literally create everything in the AI, like all of it, and give it oughts without any kind of access to this extra substance then that would refute the extra substance. Now, it's possible that if we could create an AI and it accesses this extra substance in some way, then that would 
not refute the position at the same time. But my argument was based on the idea that we we would be building everything in the AI. So it wouldn't be able to access any kind of extra substance there, but it would still be able to produce aughts, and that's what would refute the position. All right, thanks for that. Chris O asked, Danny, why is desire a non-natural state? He just asked the topic of the debate. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I would, I would just rewatch the debate and listen to my argument very carefully. It may be that he asked it at the beginning, so um, oh, well, because, okay. yeah, that was an early on question, I think. All right, so um, let's see, that somebody asked me would I debate them. Um, question for both from Gavin. He says, if the mind is part of the brain, why can't... Okay, so he, that was the question from earlier. Um, I think T-Jump already read the super chat question. Here's a question for T-Jump. A uh, question for T-Jump, how could you argue for materialism as an ontology since predictions cannot differentiate ontological questions? Uh, yeah, they can. So you can make predictions for anything. I can predict that if God exists and God is the fundamental ontology of the world, then he'll give me a gold brick every time I pray for it. So predictions can differentiate ontologies. Like They can't prove with 100% certainty one is right or not, but they can, in fact, you can make predictions based on an ontology. Sure, no problem. I'm not going to, I just want to say I'm sympathetic to the question. That's all I wanted to say. All right, cool, cool. Um, our next question was, it's another one for TJ. Let's see if we got one for Danny here. Um, well, the next one says, I think this is the last one we have. Well, we have a couple more, but they're for TJ. So question for TJ. And if you guys just want to handle these last ones as like a, both answer or whatever. Um, T jump. If imagination is physical, then wouldn't your imagined unicorn just be as real and as tangible in terms of measurement and spatial extent as anything real in the world? Yep, and it is. The problem is, is like trying to measure who's winning on a chess game. If you don't know the rules of how it interacts with the board or your mind, then you won't be able to see who's winning so the reason this the image of the unicorn can't be discovered yet is because we don't know the system of rules going on in the brain yet all right danny any uh answer on that or you want to just move on to the next one we can move on to the next question okay uh we had a super chat just come in uh from adam albilia says all of you are nothing but a bunch of figments of my imagination Avatar for my entertainment. <laughs> All right. Oh, and I wanted um, to mention, yeah, Don, this is, my episodes are sponsored by Don Fullman from the Skeptics of Middle Georgia, for sure. So check out the Skeptics of Middle Georgia. All right. The next question here is uh, from Digital Gnosis. He says, when it comes down to it, at this point, it's difficult to get past both just begging the question against each other. Then he says beliefs and desires are physical. What follows from that is superfluous. Danny? Well, I don't see a question in that. Um, I mean, I, what follows from... The, do you agree? Do I agree? I mean, I, I don't think I was begging the question, but um, he, I, someone would have to show me that, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I don't think either of us were begging the question. I think it was just didn't really present an argument in a clear enough way to understand that it was hard to understand or follow the argument from probably both our sides. So my argument was that whatever consciousness and or intentional states are, it's more reasonable to think that even if we can't explain them now, they're going to be explained by more physical stuff in the future. Saying that they cannot be physical, therefore they must be this new ontology, I think is unreasonable. So I think it's always better to infer, even if we don't know what they are now, that it's going to be more physical stuff in the future. Um, I don't think that's a circular argument. It's just an inductive argument that says all well, the past stuff is physical, the future stuff probably also going to be physical. And my argument, since you summarized mine, uh, yours, I want to summarize mine very briefly. I divide the world between what should be and what is happening, right? I think that mental states are on one side of it. I think our mental states, specifically intentional states, express how we think the world is, how what we should uh, believe, what we shouldn't do, what, sh you know, is expressing normativity. Um, natural things on the other side, right? Uh, very frequently people point out that science is not interested in what we should do or what we shouldn't do, right? At best, it can inform us of things about what happened, what is happening, what will happen, right? So I just don't think 
our desires and goodness and rightness and any of that belongs on that side, right? And that's kind of the fundamental concern I have for, for um, why I'm motivated to accept something like dualism. All right. Well, thanks to both people. I agree with Digital Gnosis. He says in the chat, thanks to both T-Jump and Danny. It was an interesting, it was interesting to listen to. And I think we can all agree with that. I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your Sundays to have this discussion. And I hope you guys have a great week. And uh, is there anything else before we go you guys want to say? Uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate the conversation. Uh, go check thank out Danny's channel. Um, what, what was your channel again? Phil Talks? Uh, Phil Talk. Now, there, be careful. It's a new channel. There's only like a few hundred subscribers. Uh, if you Google Phil Talk, it's the one with the red, sorry, YouTube Phil Talk is the one with the red icon, not the Filipino education courses. Don't do, don't do that. All right. Thanks. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And uh, hope you guys have a great week. See ya. Uh, uh, I will be on for my Sunday Q&A thing in about 30 minutes. So stay tuned for that, guys, on my stream. And then I'll probably do a poker game later tonight and stream that, hopefully. See you guys out later. <laughs>